So next up we have, um, so this is the presentation title here is Indoor Space Modeling with 3D WebGIS for Library Asset Management Discovery Visualization and more. Uh, and we have with us Matthew Toro, the Director of Maps, Imagery, and Geospatial Services at Arizona State University, Robert Cowling, Eric Friesenhan, the Map and GIS Specialist, and Jill Sherwood, the Geospatial Data Analyst, all from Arizona State University. So with that, I will let you take it away. Okay, so we have a jam-packed presentation, as our presentations always are. Um, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, today we're going to be discussing indoor space modeling with 3D WebGIS for library asset management, discovery, visualization, and more. As uh, the look on Evan's face uh, suggested, it is indeed a lofty title, lofty and ambitious title, but we hope that uh, through the progression of the presentation you see why we named it this way. My name is Matthew Toro and I'll be co-presenting with my colleagues uh, Robert, Bob Cowling, Eric Friesenhan, Jill Sherwood, and collectively we represent the Map and Geospatial Hub at Arizona State University Library. You can reach us at the ASU Library Map and Geospatial Hub by visiting our vanity URL, which is simply geospatial.asu.edu. And we're here today to embody that very lofty title by describing and explaining and dissecting our latest, uh, or one of our latest uh, projects one that we're extremely excited about called the Map and Geospatial Hub 3D Explorer, or simply 3D Explorer for short. So what exactly is this thing? I want to go ahead and show you a quick video. Uh, let's hope it plays. We opted against a live demo, but videos are also risky. Let's see how this goes. Come on. Okay. So what is the 3D Explorer? As you can see here, um, it is effectively an indoor space model, right? So we've uh, modeled in 3D the physical premises of our uh, library-based map collection and GIS center called the Map Geospatial Hub. Virtually every feature in this 3D model is selectable, uh, has attributes and features uh, connected to it. So you're seeing in these pop-up boxes uh, the staff who occupy those offices, for instance. Users can also select uh, workstations and other equipment. Um, globes and other sorts of cartographic materials that we have framed on the wall or on our little decorative shelves. There's even um, information available for the staff use only, uh, you know, digitizing equipment that we use. Um, so virtually everything is selectable, but the real power behind this is its search functionality. And this is where the customization comes in. So I just did a search for the term Lee's Ferry, a place in Northern Arizona. And I'm gonna look at all the items selected. As you can see, the map cabinet drawers, the contain contents meeting that search criteria have been highlighted. And I can look at all the contents. I can select one of those map items. The app will dynamically take me to the drawer it resides in and reveal all of the metadata, all of the descriptive attributes about that map. Alternatively, instead of doing a search, I can select and analyze our map collection manually by selecting a particular location such as this drawer seeing all of his contents and selecting one of the contents within there. Also selecting its thumbnail to see what the thumbnail shows me. So I get a little preview. Another cool feature that we're very excited about to really give a virtual or move towards a more virtual experience is this embedded 360 degree panoramic photo viewer. So the user can access that by one of the, through one of the menu widgets on the left of the app. When the box opens, the user is greeted to a 360 degree panorama photo to give a sort of vicarious in-person feel for what the space actually feels like. Uh, the user can also go to the exterior to see another uh, 360 degree panorama photo of, of the outside. And we'll talk about all these features in just a moment. There's so much context and rationale as to the question, you know, why? Why did we do this? Uh, to be as concise as I can possibly be about it, one of the major impetuses was simply we were moving. We were changing our location. This is several years in the making, uh, but uh, when I first came to ASU, Arizona State University in 2016, um, my main priority was to plan for the massive uh, relocation of our entire unit from one building called the Noble Science and Engineering Library over to the main library facility in the center of Arizona State University's Tempe campus. So it was a big deal and sort of uh, a lot of my job uh, when I first arrived here was 
prepping and planning and you know, uh, really just uh, preparing for this massive uh, move across campus here. So I could, I could sort of get deeper into this, but I'll try to be very quick. Uh, but the physical relocation required us to make significant decisions as to deaccessioning and weeding, you know, what would be kept and what would go. It was also a great opportunity to do very healthy weeding. Frankly, the collection needed it. But we also moved to a significantly smaller space. Um, so in terms of square footage, sheer real estate. So we needed to be strategic about the amount of furniture we had in there, mostly map storage furniture and other operational furniture. And obviously the contents that are stored by that furniture needed to be weeded correspondingly. Um, this obviously required a collection consolidation and reorganization, AKA, you know, just moving stuff around, shifting maps from drawers to, from one drawer to another, densifying maps, basically, you know, changing the, the, the distribution of how many maps are in each drawer. Um, this audience knows these issues quite intimately. We also, as many of you can also empathize with, uh, suffer from uh, having a large portion of our cartographic collections at ASU Library being simply uncatalogued. Um, so that, that's a big problem. And of course, my team uh, has very strong GIS experience um, and expertise. And it was quite apparent that you know, the intrinsic value of GIS, geographic information systems, for location-based asset management was so apparent that it's like, why not? So in short, we had a need for a developing a space and asset management tool. That's the gist of it. And we can talk more about some of these impetuses and why we did this during the Q&A, but there's a lot to cover here. So let's keep going. Needless to say, as I just said, it was a prime opportunity for us to leverage GIS, really use geographic information systems. I mean, we are a GIS shop after all, use GIS in sort of a meta level way to map and analyze and plan for changes in our own collections. I mean, this is the strength of GIS, right? Location-based uh, analysis. So like, like everything, right? Um, it started with, with, with a simple spreadsheet. Uh, because of the, the large portion of our collection that's uncataloged, we had to, I decided, I made a very sort of um, tough decision, but necessary to, to, under, to, to undertake the Herculean pursuit of inventorying every item in our collection. And this, this Herculean uh, undertaking continues to this day, but I'm very pleased to report that we have approximately 60% of our, all of our cartographic collections uh, that we retained, of course, uh, now fully inventory with a high degree of uh, metadata integrity. And I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, our student worker staff. Um, you know, this is sort of the latest generation of our student worker staff, as all of you know, you know, uh, students move on, you know, uh, keeping student workers for a long time is a real privilege when you can keep them because they're inherently transient, you know, they're there for, you know, one to four years, et cetera, or, or, or longer. Uh, but I just want to give a quick shout out to our current uh, sort of roster of student workers. They're fantastic. So in short, what is the 3D Explorer? The truth is it's a lot of things. My friends, I'm very proud of it. Uh, I'm not shy about uh, boasting about it. We're, we're extremely proud of what we've created here. It's a, one, a resource locator, sort of, that's its main function but it's also a resource explorer, you know, for discovery and accessibility and sort of uh, simulating the, the virtual browsing. So, you know, just the, the, bigger, the bigger library conversation of discoverability, that's sort of one of its main, discoverability and accessibility, this is sort of its fundamental role as well. But a more staff-centric value and utility of the 3D Explorer is its role as an asset management tool. And by extension, also a space management tool, because at the end of the day, of course, space, especially library space, is an asset to be managed and, and to be allocated and to be used wisely. By extension, uh, it's also a virtual tour guide uh, of the space. And let me get these zoom controls out of my screen so I can read. Um, and lastly, and maybe one might say this is a bit of a stretch, but I'll stand by it. Uh, I sincerely believe the map uh, in Geospatial Hub 3D Explorer is an engagement facilitator. It's a, it's a platform that encourages library-based engagement with library-based materials. And in this context, we're talking about cartographic and geospatial resources. My screen's frozen here. Hold on a second, friends. Okay, so let me hand it over to my colleague, Jill Sherwood, our geospatial data analyst, to explain how these fundamental building blocks work together. And she'll give you sort of a high-level overview, and then we'll talk about how these building blocks were created. Please take it away, Jill. Yeah, so as Matt mentioned, this is really the high-level overview of how all of the components of the 3D Explorer fit together. And earlier, Matt mentioned the creation of the inventory table and the initial 3D model as driven by the impending move to the new space. 
and those two components are really the main building blocks of the 3D web application. The in information in the inventory tables describes the kind of the what in our collection, whereas the 3D web scene actually provides the where of our collection. And what takes the individual components to the next level is the combination of a variety of free and open source software, along with the proprietary es Esri software that was used. Um, using the software stack, the information in the inventory table is now integrated with a spatial location in the Map and Geospatial Hub. And that allows for you know, some of the space and asset management component of our collection, as Matt also mentioned. And then the addition of the GitHub hosting resulted really in the launch of our 3D Explorer web application, as well as hosting the code that Bob will explain later. So again, um, that's a pretty high level overview. Um, Matt, Bob and Eric will actually go through um, the individual pieces and how they fit together. And as well, this is a kind of a high level over, overview, if you will, of our space in the New Hayden Library. And to understand more about the individual components, um, I'll turn it over to our map and geo specialist, Eric Friesenhan, who is responsible for creating the 3D web scene. And so um, I'll pass it on to Eric. So as Joe introduced, I am Eric Friesenhan, and it's my job to uh, basically convert our actual space here into a 3D online representation that is easily interactable. But the first step for that was to get the actual raw CAD floor plan from ASU facilities management. And after that has been acquired, which uh, then required us to figure out where we were in the space. And after we figured out where we were, which was the Northeast corner, we then had to remove all of this superfluous fluff, the, the staircase, the direction of the staircase, the doors, all the annotations, all that needs to get chopped off because having that in the model, well, that would really be very handy. But after that's all been chopped out, we then extract the uh, our space and turn it into a 2D polygon, which you can see on the right there. But having it be 2D doesn't really help us. And ArcGIS Pro, which is the software uh, that was used for this whole product or process of modeling it, allows me to turn it into a 3D object, a multi-patch, which is specifically designed for uh, 3D uh, objects and pre that, I can't, oh my God, my brain just, and uh, tools like this. And after that, you, the next step is to make sure that it is all properly uh, spatially aligned, because just because the data was extracted doesn't necessarily mean that it's properly uh, sized in the model itself. So the way that was done was measuring that glass panel there and then bringing it all into its proper sizing. And after it's all been sized, then the fun began of measuring everything from the drawers to the tables, to the little shelves, to the globes, to everything on the wall. Everything was measured and documented in I think about seven sheets of paper that are right here on my side. And after all of that has been measured and documented, then the fun process of creating these models came into play, which thanks to Esri's great software suite, uh, it was as simple as entering in the height and the width and the depth of those objects that had been recorded and placing them down. But just because they're placed down, that doesn't mean that they're in the right location. And Esri allows you to just simply drag and move them around. As you can see uh, on the left image there, those three arrows, you can just click one and you can lift it up, move it to the left or right, or move it to the north or south. And so in this little example, I move that box from the ground and put it on top of that one. But that doesn't mean it's in the correct location, because it, as you can see, there is a little gap right there. And for a model of this uh, detail, that is kind of glaring. So for more precise movements, there is a little tool called the Move Tool Tool, Move To Tool, that would allow you to uh, just make little minute changes in where it will be. So on the left, you can see it's 29.83 feet and change it a little bit, just a smidgen and to fill in that gap without needing to guesstimate. It's like, is it good now? Is it right? No that tool allows it to be exact, which is probably one of the best. But this, then uh, after everything's been made, there is a little problem. You can see in this picture, that whole work bank of computers is selected. But 
before that problem was made, uh, if I clicked on a little leg, a computer screen, or anything like that, only that object would be selected. And that is not what we want, because what, what does it mean? Like, wow, I clicked on a table leg. Right? What, is, what, about, what about everything else that's attached to that? The solution to that was to create an invisible polygon around the whole object. So that way, whenever a user clicked anywhere near or anywhere on that whole object, it would select the entire thing instead of just the leg of the globe or the little stand of the globe, or uh, let's say the little computer stand. It would get the whole thing no matter where you clicked, which really was saving grace. But after everything else has been made, now it all gets pushed into ArcGIS Online. It's time to create a web scene. And there were like 167 total objects that got uploaded into ArcGIS Online for the creation of this wonderful completed web scene, all ready to go and to be uh, pushed into our wonderful application that has been created. And I will push that over to uh, you bet uh, back to me briefly. Yeah, so I'm just gonna uh, remind you all, uh, you know, sort of to drill the sort of conceptual diagram that Jill very eloquently uh, explained. So again, we have this inventory uh, file that's that's embodied by 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 a simple, you know, it's a flat table, a DBF file integrated with the with the 3D web scene. Let me pass it over to this gentleman here, and I want to give him special recognition because. Um, uh, he's a special guy. This is, uh, again, Mr. Robert Bob Cowling. He was uh, a map and GIS, GIS intern with us, but he was so much more, uh, sincerely. He's, uh, he's really the application architect and developer. Um, he was indeed our first ever 100% remote intern. Bob's actually based, you know, we're, we're, we're out here in Phoenix, Arizona, in the Phoenix metro region. Bob's actually based in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, and again, he's not a regular intern, right? He came to us with an extremely strong GIS background, holding a Bachelor of Science in Geomatics, uh, a, a completed Master of, of GIS uh, in GIS and web map development, specifically from uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, as we all know, an excellent cartography school. But uh, Bob's an ambitious guy, so he's also finishing right now his Master of Library Science, also at the University of Wisconsin, this time at Milwaukee. So Bob, please take it away and explain to everyone how this thing really works behind the scenes. Thank you, Matt. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the underlying architecture that made this application possible. We used HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as our main programming languages, as well as the integration of several APIs in JavaScript libraries, such as the ArcGIS Online JavaScript API, ArcGIS REST API, jQuery tabulator, Viewer JS and Element Bootstrap. And I'm just gonna go through these and talk a little bit about how we used each one in the application. So the ArcGIS Online JavaScript API, this is really one of the main APIs that we used. It integrates with our 3D web scene that Eric created on ArcGIS Online. With this, it can provide custom actions when locations are selected, such as drawers or bookshelves. For example, clicking the view item list button in the drawer pop-up. It's also responsible for our auto-rotated view widgets, which were custom programmed in JavaScript. So let's talk a little bit about the ArcGIS REST API and jQuery. This is, this is how our data is returned to the application. So it queries data from our inventory table and it's executed when the user selects a location feature, such as a drawer bookshelf. For example, if the user selects drawer number one, it sends a query to the inventory Tory table and ArcGIS Online, retrieving records where the location ID is equal to one. We also use this to retrieve records in our keyword, call number, and advanced search functionality. So basically, anytime a user executes a search, the REST API is calling to our database table on ArcGIS Online and returning the results back to the application. So in other words, the results populate the item table in the application itself. Okay, and then once we have the results, where do they go? They go into tabulator. Tabulator creates a table that from the data retrieved from the REST API. Why do we use tabulator? Well, it makes life easy for us. It would be very, very time consuming to create a table with JavaScript that would have all of this functionality that tabulator provides. And it's integrated with the JavaScript API to show the location 
where a queried items are stored. It also groups and provides item counts by each location. So exa for example, drawer 41 has 254 items. The next thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit is viewer JS. It was simply used to display map scans in the application. Right now, all of that we have are low or medium resolution thumbnails, and we hope to get much higher resolution ones available in the future. You can also zoom, rotate, flip, or drag, or even view the image full screen. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about Panellum. It's a 360 panorama photo viewer. It creates a tour of one or more of our panoramic photos. And as Matt was showing you earlier in his video, we have these hotspots that basically provide information for, for selected items within the hub itself that the user may be interested in. HTML, CSS, and Bootstrap. I, I really just like Bootstrap because it, it makes life simple. It's a framework that we use for the application. What, why did we use Bootstrap? For fast and easy interface design, because it comes with pre-made items like nav bars, search bars, buttons, and modals. Again, saving us a lot of time in the development process. And once everything was completed, we loaded it onto a GitHub repository. Why do we did this? Because code updates are automatically reflected on the live site and our application then lives on GitHub pages. Finally, I wanna talk about some of the goals and challenges. I think there were a couple of main goals when we were creating this application. The first main goal is obviously to make the application user-friendly. How do we go about doing this? We made a pop-up information model that explains how to use the application when the, when the user first enters our website, or we have a basic user interface, very, very user-friendly, or a big search bar like you would have at a, at a library search, right? It's just kind of like right in your face, easy to use, easy to recognize that it's there. And we also, another goal was to make the application easily updatable for people with little or no programming experience. And some of the ways that we were able to achieve this are by hosting the inventory database table on ArcGIS Online. So if updates need to be made, you can simply overwrite the table. And we also host our web scene on ArcGIS Online. So that made all of the styling of the cabinets, bookshelves, everything, that was all a map. And you can simply use ArcGIS Online's web app to, to edit those instead of having to do it within a JavaScript environment that would be much more difficult and time consuming. And finally, I think it was important to write documentation so the application can easily be updated in the future. Thanks for that, Bob. So we're gonna sort of start the descent here, um, looking at the scalability of this application and by extension, the future directions we wanna take it. And hopefully this slide is indicative of one of the first sort of low hanging fruits of quote unquote scalability, which is simply that you know we, we focus as, as Eric and Jill elaborated, we focus on our small unit, on our, our small space, happens to be on the, on the Northeast corner of our building. Our building is technically a, a, a five story building, four story, excuse me, technically six, excuse me, four stories above ground, and two stories underground uh, for the main library building, Hayden Library, in uh, on central on the central part of ASU's Tempe campus. So I mean, you this probably hopefully makes you think like, well, we this building isn't the most accurate building model uh, dimensionally and and positionally it's correct, but uh, we've completely omitted the fourth floor of the library, the fourth above ground floor, and we have no subterranean modeling, but of course, uh, you know, the, the 3D tools we're using could allow us to, to populate the, the building spaces underneath the ground. Uh, fortunately, we don't have the burden of worrying about scaling this up to the whole library. But when you think about what libraries do, you know, there, you know so many of us, e even within the library world, have different conceptualizations of sort of the normative role of libraries. But I think we can all agree on uh, libraries are, are one, you know, sets of rich information collections and resources in our case, and in the case of our profession, uh, cartographic and geospatial resources. But there, you know, libraries are responsible for the management of these resources. And, and often there's a, there's a space-based or location-based 
component to them. Where, where are the are the resources located? So it sort of makes sense. It's not coincidental that you know this product came out of a library unit focused on mapping and GIS, but uh, you know other units across all sorts of libraries uh, that have nothing to do with any sort of spatial information could benefit from this. And, and one of the points we wanna make is that, well, because we use this hybrid software stack that's uh, primarily open source, but also is built upon Esri tools, right? The most ubiquitous, most dominant GIS tools that let's be real, uh, you know, that most of us who represent institutions of, of higher learning have access to. Of course, for those of us who come from institutions who don't subscribe to these tools, there are of course free and open source alternatives, but it, it begs the question of, of maintenance and updatability, et cetera. And this is something that we sincerely want to commit to and ensure that it has life for years and years. You know, after this current roster of staff leaves, the next generation of professionals uh, will, will adopt our stuff, uh, will adopt these tools and, and, the, and the underlying data components behind them. And, and we want to make sure that we sort of pass the baton to the next generation of MAP and GIS professionals, you know, that, you know, give, give this unit to them in, in better shape than we found it, if you will. So, and there's a lot of other sort of technical infrastructural things, uh, such as uh, expanding this to, uh, to our growing enterprise uh, instance of, of, of these tools, um, linking to a, a forthcoming image server, integrating with other ASU libraries and repositories, et cetera. I won't belabor those, but we can talk more about them. Now, one last thing I, I, I want to emphasize is um, building a library ecosystem. And forgive me, am I doing okay on time? Do we have a few minutes? You're doing great, Matt, yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. I think that was Evan, thank you, Evan. So, uh, and this may be, sound like an overreach again, but um, you know, the grand vision here is really about trying to build a map and geospatial library ecosystem, at least for, for, for our own ecosystem. And by extension, you know, a broader ecosystem with, with all of your institutions and, and the organizations that all of you here at WAML represent. Um, but so let me draw an example here of what I mean by this lofty quoted term ecosystem, which I think is sometimes an abused term. So I wanna use it cautiously. Um, but you know, so we have this other platform that I won't get into too deeply, but we have this platform called ASU Geodata and uh, it's built on, uh, it's an ArcGIS hub site. Um, it sounds like we're really an Esri shop, but it, yeah, I mean, you know, these tools are great and, and they, they allow us to scale our whole operation. And on our, uh, our ASU geodata site, um, we, we use it primarily for distributing and curating geospatial data sets, as I'm sure many of, of you and your home organizations do. But we also have a dedicated section on ASU geodata for spatial indexes. So uh, if you visit ASU geodata, you'll see we have sort of a dedicated page on that Esri ArcGIS hub site dedicated to our spatially indexed collections, such as spatially indexed aerial photos, spatially indexed maps. And one such example of one of those spatial indexes, and of course with this audience, I don't need to sort of explain what this is, right? It's uh, effectively a geographical finding aid for materials such as maps and, and aerial photos and geospatial data sets that are inherently spatial, right? So as a discovery mechanism, putting them on a map and showing people, oh, you know, letting people navigate and search for them spatially is, is advantageous. You know, GIS and map users often like to look at things across the space that those maps are representing. And one such example is this collection uh, called Plans and Profiles of the Colorado River. It's a collection of uh, Colorado River surveys conducted in, in the early 20th century, yada, yada. But the user can, can look at this spatial index and, and browse the maps that pertain to this small sub-collection called Plans and Profiles of the Colorado River. Well, if you go to the 3D Explorer application that we just presented on and, and visit the physical location where these plans and profiles are located, it happens to be in drawer 41, and you can reference all the metadata for this particular collection or the maps in this collection, you'll see that at each item level, drawing from the inventory database table, when available, this is sort of the gold standard, the, the, the vision we're, we're really shooting for is you have these additional fields down here. Sorry for the resolution, but I had to zoom in. And so obviously we link out to the ASU library catalog. Uh, when available, we link out to a spatial index, such as the spatial index I just showed you. And uh, there's another one, when we've, when we've committed the resources to do it, to quote unquote, learn more about this item. So here's the spatial index. And learn more about this item links to specialized collection-based curatorial treatment that we will be given these collections. And this is a very deliberate uh, setup for uh, one of our colleagues, Ms. Ramey Toolgood, who will be presenting tomorrow at WAML on this 
project specifically, visualizing the survey plans and profiles of the Colorado River. As you all can see, it's, it's built on an, on, on an Esri story map, and it's a quite impressive story map, so I look forward to hearing Ramey talk about it tomorrow. But that's sort of the broad vision. I want to hand it back over to my colleague, Jill Sherwood, to tell us, uh, tell you all how you can access the 3D Explorer application. Yeah, so um, how do you get to the 3D Explorer? Um, you would simply go to the vanity URL that Matt mentioned earlier, geospatial.asu.edu. And that URL will redirect you to the Map and Geospatial Hub homepage, which is within the ASU library home site. Um, from that homepage, you can see all the links to the different pages that we have, where you can find more information about us, our collections, um, including the geospatial data maps, as well as the projects. And links to the 3D Explorer can be found on many of those pages, but the projects page probably has more information about the 3D Explorer, as well as more information about some of the spatial indices that um, it links to when you click on some of those images. And finally, uh, if you're interested in the code behind the scenes, you can access all of that through the Map and Geospatial Hub GitHub site. This is where the 3D Explorer is hosted um, as a GitHub page, and it also has everything that you would need to know to basically recreate this 3D Explorer if you wanted to. Um, with that, um, we want to thank you for your time and open it up to any questions. Thank you so much. This is this is amazing. Um, I, I was just sitting back in in awe the whole time. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a great team of of a of diverse set of folks here. And Matt, I mean, or I don't know who was who rounded these these troops and created this roster of yours, but it's amazing. And it, it sounds like you just all have great skills to complement one another. Um, we do have uh, we do have some questions in the Q and A. Um, I don't know. So we've been very conversation-like uh, here at WAML so far. So I don't know, Matt, would you prefer, would anybody prefer me to read these to you? Or would you like to just sort of take these as you as you see fit? You know, I, I, I consume so much oxygen talking so much. I would love it if someone would would hold our hands and, and go through the questions, please. Totally, I will, I'm happy to, yes. Um, so I'm gonna ask the first question. Oh, well, I'm gonna ask a question from Ryan. Uh, and um, the question is, how much maintenance does the Explorer require to ensure it's always up to date? I'm assuming that the maps are more or less where they're going to stay for the foreseeable future, so you don't end up uh, having to, a large-scale Explorer location slash metadata update project. Expected changes will mostly be new acquisitions. That's an awesome question, a fundamental question. Uh, one, of the, one of the guiding principles on the design of this, uh, I'm going to... I think Bob, I mean, all of us can answer that. Uh, I'll give it to Bob and Eric, if you wanted to, Eric or Jill, please turn in. Sure, right, absolutely. I think constantly at the Map and Geospatial Hub, there's always new inventory coming in and that that probably is the number one way that, that you would have to maintain those records as well as updating the metadata if, if anything were to change or you were to develop a new metadata schema, which we actually did for this project developed a, a metadata schema. So yeah, absolutely. I think you're right in the fact that the biggest challenge or the biggest thing that we would have to do is just keep adding new inventory. What's already there is mostly going to stay the way it is. I, I think there are some plans for more high resolution images and an image server and things like that. And, and really good question. Yeah, so I'd like to just real quick hop in on that. It's uh, even if maps did change a location, it's very easy to update that because every drawer, shelf, cabinet, et cetera, that a map could live in has a numeric ID from like 1 to 264 or something. And the inventory spreadsheet has a record or a column for that uh, ID. So if it changes its location, say it goes from drawer one to drawer 40 or something, just change that one to a 40, upload the new table, and it's automatically shifted over to that drawer. It's very, very easy to keep this thing clean as long as you remember to change the numbers. Jill, you want to add anything to that? No, I think they both covered it all. Um, I mean, the, the ease of use of this thing really is what makes it work well for us, so. Yeah. I mean, but of course, whenever new applications or new tools are developed, you know, um, it, it, it took a, hopefully as, as demonstrated just now, a full team effort to build this thing. Um, but it also creates 
new considerations on uh, maintenance workflows, right? So um, part of the way we scale our operation and are able to do work like this is that we keep really solid internal documentation, not only on customized web applications like this, but also the, the behind the scenes sort of staff only workflows like, okay, what is the frequency with which we update our inventory? What is the, what is the cadence? What is the frequency with which our student workers are busily plugging away, doing data entry, refining our ever growing inventory spreadsheet? And then what is the, the schedule by which we, Eric uploads that new table and you know, does all the interrelated update tasks. But um, I think the point we really wanna convey is the scalability, not only with our own organization, like frankly, we're here, I, I'm here, not, I don't wanna speak on behalf of my team right now, but I'm here to evangelize like all of, you know, many of you have solid GIS skills and relatively inexpensively and with relatively low technical barriers, similar things can be done for your own shops. And, Someone made an awesome comment. I think it was Chrissy very generously saying, this is how you protect your physical maps. Yeah, I think so. Uh, this is not a move away from you know, physical collections. This is actually a sort of protection and enhancement and a, a sort of um, perpetuity of, of, of the value of these physical collections, which are questions that we ask ourselves every day. Great. Uh, I am I'm gonna ask a question from Laura, which um, I think you answered this question later on in Laura Condit, um, but I'm gonna ask, ask it anyway in case you wanna um, say anything about it. Can metadata be exported from the 3D Explorer, say for batch creating brief catalog uh, bibs or the uncatalogued material? Uh, I, I will just say before Bob takes it away. Yeah. Every, every facet of the 3D Explorer, every single facet from colors to fonts to styling to positioning to uh, fundamentally features and functionality such as the ability to download have been painstakingly thought over. And uh, the, we had very robust discussions about the retention or the, uh, the removal of the download functionality. We ultimately opted against it. Bob, give us your insights there. What are your thoughts? Sure, absolutely. So we had a version one of this 3D Explorer and one, one of the features that it had was you could do just that, export the table as, as metadata to a, to a CSV or Excel document, but we kind of weren't sure if people would use it or if it really made sense in version two. So we, we kind of scrapped it. Uh, I'm starting to think maybe it, it was useful. And that's, that's kind of another thing with an application like this. It's going to evolve as you get feedback, constant feedback from, from real people using it every day. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, some comments. Holy cow, this is amazing. Um, how practical is this for any uh, general business asset management, even for this university? Um, and they're thinking of showing assets for insurance coverage, lost documentation after a disaster, et cetera. I'll just say Can briefly, because I want to make sure we cover all or most of the, of the questions. I will just say, um, I was baffled, uh, you know, where, where we, we have done some preliminary dives into the, the, liter the library literature, and there are some precedents, conceptual precedents, where people, where MAP and GIS professionals have conceptualized or done very, frankly, um, very insignificant prototyping or, or, or sort of conceptual diagramming of, of what location-based asset management with GIS and library context could look like. And uh, no one's done it surprisingly, uh, but I would say in other sectors, it was sort of, to me, it seems like, you know, and I, I, the, the, the example I often use internally with my team is like, oh, I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm sure large logistics companies like, oh, or uh, mail delivery, you know, USPS or FedEx or, or other sort of logistical and resource-based uh, asset companies have, have use for this. Um, private sector companies don't often care about writing academic papers and publishing the presidents and, you know, sharing it with the world. But uh, I would not be surprised if there are other many examples of viable cases of location based GIS based asset management tools, but in the library sector, there seems to be a dearth. So we hope partially that this uh, sort of prototype and this first stab at it um, sets a precedent that can be adopted widely. Um, did that, I hope that answered your question. I, I, I probably deviated a bit. Closely, am I? Thank you, Matt. That was great. Thanks, Evan. Um, this is a question from Stephanie. Uh, first off, great work. Another, another comment. 
Did you run into any issues with converting CAD drawings to GIS? And uh, do you have any lessons learned on the data interoperability processes slash workflows to share? So it was actually really simple to convert the CAD to GIS. There is a tool in the ArcGIS Pro tool set that would take that CAD drawing data and just convert it to, I believe it converted it to a polyline at first. And from there, in order for my visualization to work well, I actually converted that over to a polygon. And from then it started the whole process of multi-patch and stuff, but it went, it was straightforward, uh, I would say. Uh, it, the only issue is that it took a while to load because there was a lot in that data. Great, and we have some, uh, there's some questions that were directly in the chat. So I'm gonna get to those now. Um, I think the first one was, uh, how many people were involved in this project? The whole team right here. This is it, and, and including student workers. But I, I should say this, it's really important uh, to acknowledge, you know, the 3D model, you know, what you all see in the final application is a highly refined 3D model that goes, all the credit goes to Eric Friesenhan. But he also has student workers that he can delegate some of the measuring uh, components to. And student workers have been testing. We've had a 3D model of our space ever since we were at that initial library building. And those were the, the foundations of that have been uh, created by waves of uh, transitional interns and student workers that we've had. Um, and, and a lot of this, you know, although Eric did, you know, took it significantly many levels up in terms of the sophistication and the, the quality of, of our active model. Um, Eric was able to stand on the sort of the figurative shoulders of giants or you know, on, the, on the foundation laid by others. And a lot of the workflows you know, for developing the 3D geometries were established, you know, adjusting Z values, uh, modifying tools like that. Eric just uh, took it to the next level. And, um, but we were able to build on a foundation, uh, you know, a multi-year progression of learning along the way, learning how um, these pieces would increasingly fit together. And when Bob came around, he really came with the with the sort of um, with the with the intellect and, and innovation to 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 find the glue, the, the figurative glue to, to make all this work together. Awesome. I, I don't know if you answered this question or not, so I'm gonna ask it. Um, how do you add new items to digital drawers? New um, items to digital drawers? That's a great question. Eric, take it away. Uh, so if I wanted to add a new item to say drawer 201. I would simply in um, in the master spreadsheet where uh, all those records are in the drew to, drawer two hundred and one section. I would add a new row, fill in the data, and then upload the table. And there it is; it's all up. And, and that's the beauty of it. That's what we're proudest of, actually, right? Like copy and paste a record, you know, update the latest iteration of the table, and all those new records in that table populate to their digital drawers, right? Maybe, maybe in a future presentation should really focus on uh, the creation, first off, of creating drawer IDs. I'm sure many of us have flat file cabinets or some other physical furniture for storing stuff. Do you have an ID system? Because first and foremost, you need to you need an object ID, right, to link with the records. So, you know, once you link up those, uh, the records in a table to the geometry to which they correspond, things are quite easy. You just need to first lay out the system, right? And that's a simple identification system. Right. Heather, I see you have your hand up. Did you? Yeah, wanna, that was uh, my uh, question. So my follow-up, Matt, is how much of your collection is in your library catalog, and did you have, or, or was your collection largely not catalogs? I don't. Uh, if you could it, it, go into that in a little bit of detail. That's really important. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the one of the points I quickly glossed over because I didn't want to get bogged down in it all. But yeah, uh, one, another reason for this, the reason why we sort of almost unilaterally, like we had to, uh, we, why we took on the the unenviable task of of inventorying every sheet, every every asset in our in our small collection or smallish collection. Um, was because the catalog didn't do that job for us. Uh, so, so to be direct, Heather, no, uh, a very small portion, only a small portion of our collection was cataloged already. And so with that dearth of data, how can we make decisions uh, you know, systematically and relatively efficiently 
on, on a fixed timeline, how can we systematically go through our entire collection to make bulk deaccession decisions? And we all know part of the awkwardness and unwieldiness of map collections. You open a physical drawer or, you know, depending on what sort of storage, take out large acid-free manila folders, put them on a table, flip it open. They are inherently unwieldy. We love them. We, we romanticize maps and they're beautiful and it's great to hold them. But uh, another feature of this tool is that it precludes the need to physically go in every time we want to look at stuff. But first and foremost, we need, we need the data there. So um, we created the inventory to address the dearth of data. Uh, so we, we created the inventory sort of as a tool, as a mechanism for more systematically making decisions based on multiple criteria um, related to you know, the, 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 the scope of our uh, collection development policy, which prior to, prior, prior to any of this, we didn't have, the, the map collection didn't have a formal collection development policy. So, uh, so we needed that inventory and um, no, sorry, I went down a rabbit hole. No, uh, most of our collection was not cataloged. Thank you for that. Either. We have uh, one more question. Thank you, Matt, for that answer. We have one more question from Chris. This is uh, one that hits home because uh, some of us, I think, were pretty opt opportunistic over COVID to undertake projects that we might not be able to do with, with people in spaces. Um, so this question is, uh, absent of COVID lockdown, do you think that this would have, this project would have been done? I would say, yes, I, I, I do think it would have. Uh, uh, Bob, Bob joined us as, as an intern, but uh, uh, I've talked with Eric and Jill and previous veterans of the Map and Geospatial about this. I've been, I've been dreaming about this for a long time. I, I, I've wanted to do this. I'm a GIS guy. I'm a feral map librarian, as we all as we all know the joke goes. You know, I just uh, I slipped into the library world, and I'm and I'm just saying, okay, how do you do this well? Well, there's a tool for that. It's called GIS, and you know, and I and uh, it's made my job way easier. So we can start focusing. You know, once we sort of get our collection management and maintenance locked down, then we can focus on the fun stuff, which is curation, application development. Right? We want to automate. We want to use technology to do the to do the sort of tedious, painful stuff. Right? And then focus on geospatial analysis, data curation, uh, methodological consultation, and focus. That's the niche that we really want to occupy at the Map and Geospatial Hub. So, um, first things first, right? Building the infrastructure to manage our physical our physical uh, assets first and foremost. Great, well said. Yep, I agree with you. Getting over that hump. Um, we have two minutes. I don't know. Uh, oh, wait, you know what? Actually, if we have two minutes, I'm going to ask another one that was in the regular chat, um, if you're okay with this. Are you planning on working cross on working cross institutions to have all map libraries lined up one after the other in the model? I, I think that's ambitious, but I think um, it's not overly overly ambitious. I think, you know, Five to fifteen years from now, I mean, that's where we're all moving, right? When we talk about federated repositories, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not. I, I do think this tool is very. I, forgive me if I'm misinterpreting the question, but I do think this tool is definitely adoptable by all of your respective institutions. Um, you know, in a perfect world, all of the, you know, in a perfect world, all this information is linked anyway. Uh, and and I think I don't want to get too futuristic here, but I mean, um, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to to think that. All of our university libraries, at least for public institutions, will eventually be integrated, right? I mean, that's why we have these conferences. That's why we talk about, you know, Big Ten, Big Ten Academic Geoportal Alliance. You know, like we're we're talking about scaling up, uh, and ultimately, this is about user access, public access to cartographic and geospatial technologies. So, uh, forgive me if I'm taking this too far, but yeah, I, I don't think it's overreaching to or too far fetched to think that that that's that's a, a worthy goal for all of us to want to pursue. As long as I don't have to model them all. Well, you're the guy. I mean, people know who to call if you need oh, a solid model. Good. Thanks again for listening to us, guys. As you can see, we're extremely proud and excited to be sharing this. We, we put a lot of time in, into this presentation in particular. So uh, this audience in particular is the one we are most excited to share this project with. So uh, thank you again for hearing us out. Thank you to everyone. That was very well received. A uh, lot of interest here. So I'm sure we'll get some follow up questions uh, offline. Uh, we're going to move into a break, our 15 minute break. This is not a sponsor break. So you won't miss every, anything if you, if you get up and want to stretch your legs. We'll come back in 15 minutes. And I'm going to put up the uh, coming up next slide. 
Uh, so take a break and we will get started in 15.